Okay. Uh, for the sake of time, let's let's start uh, the last session of uh, today, uh, which is going to be a second session on generative models, uh, and I would argue a session on generative models for uh, scientific computing. And the first talk will be given by Agile, who unfortunately uh, is still in Berkeley. Uh, and um, take it away. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it there. I was really looking forward to it, but I had problems with my visa. Um, and so the title of this talk is Compressed Sensing Using Generative Models. Um, it'll be halfway between theory and practice. And this is joint work with my collaborators from UT Austin. And yeah. So here's a brief outline of the talk. I will spend some time on background, then describe the posterior sampling algorithm we've been looking at recently and finally applications to compressed compress sensing MRI. So what is the problem of compressed sensing? Very simply put, if you want to recover some unknown signal, for example, an image from noisy linear measurements, then compressed sensing can be used in these uh, sorts of applications. So for example, if you, if you want to get a brain scan from a patient, you would put them into an MRI machine. The machine would take some readings of their brain. And using their, those readings, you would like to reconstruct the brain scan. And similarly in astronomy and oil, oil exploration, you, you get some measurements of an unknown signal and you would like to reconstruct that signal from those measurements. In the simplest form, we model this as a system of linear measurements where Y denotes the measurements that you obtain a denotes a matrix that takes you from the image to measurements. X star denotes the unknown image or signal. And you may have some additive noise. And for notational sake, M would be the number of measurements you obtain. And N would be the dimensionality of the signal that you're trying to reconstruct. And the fundamental questions in compressed sensing are how many measurements do you need to recover the signal? And also, what algorithm would you use for recovery? Now, let's take an even simpler case where there's no noise in the measurements. Now, we can write this as a system of linear equations, where, you, again, you have the measurements over here, you have the measurement matrix, and you're trying to recover this unknown image using the measurements and the measurement matrix. And elementary linear algebra tells you that if you have fewer observations of the signal than there are there are dimensions in the signal, then this is an underdetermined system of linear equations, and there are infinite solutions to the system. And hence, uniquely recovering x star is impossible if m is smaller than n. However, if you impose additional structure on this problem, it's indeed possible to recover x star exactly using very few measurements. So for example, the seminal result by Candice Rauberg and Dow in 2006 showed that if x star is k-sparse, meaning that it's a, it's a large vector, but the number of non-zero entries are at most k, and the rest of the entries in the vector are zero, then the number of measurements you would need scales as the number of non-zeros times the logarithm of the dimension of x star. And this also assumes that a the measurement matrix has some nice properties. So for example, if it's drawn Gaussian IID, then it will satisfy these nice properties. And the intuition is that since you're only considering vectors that are sparse, these form a low dimensional subset of Rn. And since if you're choosing k entries where x star is non-zero, there are only n choose case choices for the support. And the number of observations you need is roughly the log of those choices for the support, which is k log n over k. And the algorithm for recovery would be simply lasso, where you say that you optimize for your image x, such that once you multiply x with the measurement matrix A, it's as close as possible to y in, say, L2 norm. And you also add a penalizer for the L1 norm of x to ensure that it is sparse. So if you run this with an appropriate choice of lambda, you will exactly recover X star using very few measurements. And now a natural question to ask is why do people care about sparsity? It's because if you look at images in some 
harmonic basses, like for example, in the wavelet basses, if you take this exa if you take this image of a castle and you perform a wavelet transform, you see that most of the wavelet coefficients are sparse. And now, if instead of recovering the image in the pixel domain, you can recover it in the wavelet domain. And since this is a bijective transform, you you you're okay if you just recover these sparse wavelet coefficients using compressed measurements of it. And this is the classical 90s or 2000s signal processing approach to compression and compressed sensing. And many algorithms like JPEG exploit sparsity in an appropriate harmonic basis to, to achieve uh, tremendous uh, compression rates. And in this talk, we will not use sparsity anymore. We will talk about how we can leverage machine learning. And I'm not trying to be adversarial to sparsity. I only mean to say that this is a more contemporary version of sparsity. And the intuition is that every year, millions of MRIs are taken. And this gives us some uh, data-driven model for modeling these images. And if you have these millions of images, you should be able to look at them and develop some better understanding or more complicated understanding of them than just simply having them as sparse in a wavelet basis. And this structural understanding of the MRI, or, or the structural understanding of what a brain MRI looks like, should allow you to take fewer measurements in the future, which will imply lesser scan times and make MRIs more uh, accessible and inexpensive. And if you want to model images in 2023, I think, in my opinion, the best way are through deep convolutional neural networks or transformers. And in this talk in particular, I'm going to con concentrate on generative models. So we had prior work in 2017, which said that if you consider low dimensional generative models, such as GANs and VAEs, these are continuous differentiable functions from a low dimensional space, RK, to a high dimensional space, RN, where K is much smaller than N. And the rough idea is that since your model is sufficiently smooth, and it's a low dimensional mapping from, it's a mapping from a low dimensional space to a high dimensional space. The range that of images captured by your generative model is low dimensional. And this is analogous to what Can you hear us, Ajil? Uh, sorry, my Zoom crashed. I'm not sure what went wrong there. Ah, OK. Uh, just give me a minute. Yes. Sorry about that. OK, um, yes. so I'm sorry about that. Uh, I don't know what happened. Um, so the first theorem we were able to prove back in 2017 is that if you have a generative model which is L Lipschitz, then the number of measurements you need scales as the input dimension of your generative, generative model times the logarithm of the Lipschitz constant. And if you're now considering 
ReLUID neural networks with D layers, then the number of measurements scales as the input dimension times the depth of the neural network times the logarithm of the, uh, of the output dimension. And these results are really analogous to what we find in sparsity because uh, in sparsity was just k log n, and now we have these substitutes which are the Lipschitz constant of the neural net of the neural net, or the depth times the logarithm of the output dimension of the neural net. And uh, really, there were there were lower bounds which said that generative models are actually a strict generalization of sparsity. One can create generative models that output sparse vectors, but these would be handcrafted generative models and Instead, if someone gave you data, you will be able to learn generative models that capture richer structure in your data. And the algorithm is also a generalization of Lasso, and it's provably polytime in certain settings. This is work that's not by us. Right. So low-dimensional generative models are good because they allow you to prove theorems that are very analogous to what we find in sparsity. But empirically, when we run them, we find this very interesting phenomenon where we trained a generative model that goes from a 100-dimensional space to like a 12,000-dimensional space. And the y-axis here shows you the reconstruction error between the estimated image and the true image. And the x-axis shows you how many measurements each algorithm was given. And what we see is that the red line is the algorithm we propo proposed in 2017. And the green and the blue lines are what Lasso would, uh, are, the, are the performance by Lasso. And what we find is the red line drops off very quickly when you have few measurements. But once you hit 500 measurements, it plateaus. And the reason for this is that we only have a, a model that's going from R100 to 12,000. And it has some number of layers. And once you hit 500 measurements, you've already found the best possible image that the generative model can produce. Because for example, if this, were, this for example was run in human faces. So you take someone's face, you, you take measurements of that face, and now you try to reconstruct what the face, person's face would be. And since the generative model is not perfect, it can't capture every human face. It faces some fundamental representation error or capacity or like limited capacity which leads it to this plateauing phenomenon where after after 500 measurements, you giving me more information doesn't help my generative model because it simply cannot do any better. In Lasso, we can tune that lambda parameter, which allows for more or less sparsity. But in generative models, this uh, low dimensional uh, space is fixed and hence there's no, no, there's nothing you can tune unless you train a new generative model from scratch. And another interesting phenomenon that was observed by uh, Asim et al. is that if you train a GAN on human faces, it tries to impose a face on everything. So this shows that it has a huge data set bias. So for example, in this example of a, of a barn that has like something that looks like eyes and a mouth, the, a generative model would try to reconstruct a face on this, whereas Lasso gets grainy images, but it's at least able to tell that this thing is not a human face. And this really tells you that there's something um, really problematic here with using low dimensional generative models of GANs. And um, in and around this time is when diffusion models and score based generative models started becoming more popular. In fact, score based models were invented around 2018 or 2019. And diffusion models were invented around 2020. And uh, for those of you not familiar with this, I'll briefly go through what a diffusion model is. I won't talk about uh, how it's trained. And the rest of the the rest of my talk is basically going to argue that we should all be using diffusion models and posterior sampling using diffusion models. So diffusion models try to do the following problem, where if you have a probability distribution P, and assume there's some variance beta square, let P tilde be the annealing of P, where I'm taking P and convolving it with a Gaussian of variance beta square. So this makes P a little smoother. And 
of course, this P tilde would be the distribution of a random variable that has distribute that is distributed according to P, and it also has some Gaussian noise of variance beta square added to it. And there exists some algorithm where if you give it IID samples of x1 to xm drawn from your distribution P, then a diffusion model can be trained to go from Rn cross R to Rn, where the, the first parameter in Rn would be some, uh, some image in the support in Rn, and beta would be how much annealing is happening to the distribution. And this diffusion model is trained to approximate the gradient of the log of the annealed density at x. And the key point in diffusion models is that is that they are trained to go, is that they are trained to map x over various beta. So you can you can pass in um, a range of betas and it will approximate the gradient of the log anneal distribution at that noise variance beta. And since these diffusion models are supported on the whole of Rn, they, they don't suffer the same capacity problems that GANs do. And what we observe is that they also don't exhibit the same data set biases uh, observed in, in GANs. Um, before I go to the next part, are there any questions? Also feel free to interrupt me if there are questions. And now we'll talk about how we used diffusion models and procedure sampling uh, in our experiments in theory. And procedure sampling is a very intuitive uh, algorithm that one can run. So basically it says that, assume your distribution had some probability distribution associated with it, and you're given linear measurements with Gaussian noise, then a possible estimate for this um, X unknown X star is to draw X hat, which is distributed according to the posterior distribution of images conditioned on the measurements. Now, you know, if you ask a Bayesian this, they would tell you that this is the obvious thing to do. But I think until very recently, we just didn't have generative models that were rich enough to capture this posterior distribution and to also allow you to sample from it. And if you want to perform this posterior sampling, you can run, you can approximate it via Langevin dynamics, which follows the following, which is the following iterative procedure, where you initialize your image to just be IID Gaussian noise. And then for T large enough, you run this process over and over again, where the image at time P plus one is the image at time P plus some positive step size along the gradient of the log, pos log posterior, plus some Gaussian noise whose variance is proportional to the step size that you just took. And now if you write, if you write this posterior out using Bayes' rule, you get the gradient of the marginal density plus the likelihood density minus the log of the normalization factor. But since you're differentiating with respect to your current image, the gradient of this normalization factor with respect to your current image is zero, and that goes away. And the diffusion model can provide some approximation for the gradient of the log marginal. And this log likelihood term is um, a Gaussian because the way these measurements were generated were through uh, a linear transformation plus uh, Gaussian noise. And so if you write that all out, the, the gradient of the log Gaussian density to, becomes this expression here. The gradient of the normalization factor is a constant with respect to x, so it becomes zero. And now you have a closed form expression for what the Langevin updates should be. So this says that assuming you had access to the true posterior of, your, uh, of the distribution of the image, if you're given linear measurements with Gaussian noise, then you can write out the update, update rules for Langevin dynamics to sample from the posterior distribution. Uh, 
And this gradient log P term comes from the diffusion model. And okay, this is a little bit of a disclaimer because when I was running these experiments in 2020, the diffusion models are not very well understood and algorithms relating to diffusion models are also not well understood. So it wasn't clear how one should be sampling. And now there's been a lot of progress in it. Uh, but three years ago, I, I sort of uh, hacked this procedure to actually get it to work in practice. And the reason, the reason things break uh, is that it's not that the equations on the previous slide are incorrect. They are correct, but they don't consider the fact that diffusion models learn the annealed distribution. So while I said that a diffusion model would be able to approximate the gradient of the log marginal, marginal of your image, it, diffusion models don't actually do this. They learn some gradient log of P tilde, where P tilde would be um, an annealed or mollified version of P. And since I don't consider that annealing, if you do actually try writing out the former equations using annealing, it breaks and it's no longer correct. And a more principled version of it appeared in iClear 2023, which by these authors. So it actually took roughly two or three years to figure out what is a principled way of using diffusion models, such that you account for the uh, posterior sampling and also the annealing that happens in while training diffusion models. Um, but in my experiments, I simply uh, introduce some hacks and hyperparameters that allow, that seemingly allow me to get things to work in practice, at least in practice. Yeah, it, it seemed to work very clear. Okay. And then we ran our experiments on the Flickr Faces data set. So recall I said that GAN suffer this huge uh, data set bias or some sort of bias where the top row here shows high resolution images. The second row shows blurry, like downscaled uh, versions of the upper row images. The third row shows reconstructions by Pulse, which is based on an algorithm that uses GAN and does map estimation. And you can see that it's really propagating or uh, destroying like ethnic and race features. Whereas if you use diffusion models and posterior sampling, you you seem to we seem to preserve uh, certain details much better. And the key point here is that the GAN and the diffusion model were trained on the same data set, which were Flickr faces. So whatever racial biases existed in Flickr faces is inherited by both of these generative models. But we're, we're able to see that clearly one is better than the other. And also they, they have an algorithmic difference in that Pulse performs um, a point estimate via map estimation, whereas posterior sampling is randomized and samples from the posterior. Right. And recall that diffusion models are supported on the whole ambient space of Rn. So it's not clear why we should be able to use them for compressed sampling. Most compressed sampling results, or almost all compressed sampling results, requires some low dimensional structure in the image that can be exploited to get fewer measurements. So now a question now would be, if you were to take diffusion models, how do we characterize what this lower dimensional structure is? And in order to achieve this goal, we propose this new notion of approximate covering numbers, which is a measure of the complexity of a probability distribution. And it says that if you're given any distribution P, and some parameters epsilon and delta, which are positive, then the approximate covering number at epsilon and delta of P is the smallest set of epsilon radius balls I need to cover one minus delta mass in P. So if you look at this heat map of a probability distribution, the blue areas are like low density areas and the reds are the high density areas. If I take epsilon radius balls and keep them along the diagonal, then these cover most of the mass under P. There's some mass outside, but if you take the union of these balls, it covers a large fraction of P. And you, if you look, and if you also count these balls, they they seem to be only along the diagonal rather than uh, uh, in the whole plane. 
So this tells you that there is, if you're willing to throw out some probability mass in some probability mass captured by a diffusion model, then there there may exist some lower dimensional structure, and you you should be able to exploit that to get compressed sensing results that are similar in spirit to what we are classically used to in compressed sensing and sparsity. Right, and we are arguing that this notion of approximate covering numbers exactly characterizes um, how many measurements you would need to do compressed sensing recovery using this probability distribution. And we have the following theorems, which, which work for IID Gaussian matrices A. So in this setting, uh, A is scaled. Uh, the variance of A is scaled, such that the norm of your measurements is roughly the same as the norm of your uh, ground truth X star. And the additive noise eta is scaled such that it has norm roughly epsilon. And the upper bound we can show is that if you run posterior sampling for this measurement process, where A is Gaussian and the noise is also Gaussian, then the number of measurements you need is scales logarithmically as the epsilon delta approximate covering number of the distribution of X star. And if you do posterior sampling, then the estimate x hat is epsilon close in L2 norm to x star with probability one minus three delta. So this guarantee is, it's the sort of guarantee that you would get in um, like frequentist uh, statistics and uh, compressed sensing, but it's, it's, a, it's an algorithm that's randomized. And there's also some failure probability that depends on how much mass in your probability distribution P that you're not considering. Because recall that this epsilon delta covering number tries covering a one minus delta fraction of P using small radius balls. And this result tells you that if you did posterior sampling with measurements that scale logarithmically as this epsilon delta covering number, then the posterior sampling estimate is epsilon closed in L2 naught. And furthermore, we are able to show this robustness result which says that if there's a mismatch between the distribution of your ground truth image, so if it's drawn according to some distribution R, and you only have an approximate posterior, meaning that you're sampling X hat from P of X condition on Y, then the upper bound still holds as long as the distribution of your image R and the distribution of your generative model P are epsilon square root delta close in Wasserstein distance. And the reason I say that posterior sampling is almost optimal is that we're able to show a very close lower bound, which says that if your image is drawn according to P and assuming it's compact, meaning that the norm of X star is at most R, then any algorithm that gets epsilon close to X star, that any reconstruction algorithm that gets epsilon close to X star with probability one minus delta requires measurements that scale as the logarithm of the epsilon delta covering number. Now, the reason I say almost optimal is that there's an extra additive, there's an extra multiplicative log one plus R square factor in the denominator. And these epsilon and delta constants that the constants that multiply epsilon and delta are different between the lower and the upper bound. In the upper bound, I had log epsilon delta. In the lower bound, I have three epsilon and four delta. An interesting thing to note about this lower bound is that in traditional compressed sensing lower bounds, we would construct a minimax instance P, which is hard to reconstruct, and then we would show a lower bound for that. In contrast, this lower bound works for any probability distribution. You give me a distribution P of your choice and this lower bound will still hold for it. This is not a minimax lower bound. It's an in per instance lower bound. And our approach to showing this lower bound is purely information theoretic. So recall that the upper bound said that if you wanna get epsilon close with probability one minus three delta, the number of measurements you need is log of the epsilon delta covering number. And if you wanna show the lower bound, you you should think of this whole process as being a Gaussian channel, 
so the mutual information between X star, which is the ground truth image, and X hat, which is the reconstructed image, is at most the mutual information between X star and Y. This first inequality is by, via the data processing inequality. And the second inequality follows from uh, Shannon's AWGN theorem, which says that the mutual information between X star and Y is at most M times the log SNR. And the reason this holds is that Y is a linear transformation of X star and has added Gaussian noise to it. So you can directly apply Shannon's AWGN theorem. And now the only part that remains is to show that if you're able to successfully get epsilon close uh, to X star, then the mutual information between X star and X hat should be at least the log of the epsilon delta covering number. And this is actually very close in spirit to Fano's inequality. And the main difficulty here is that Fano's inequality is typically proven or is, is proven for a discrete distribution and a uniform distribution over discrete elements. Whereas here, P is continuous and arbitrary, and we need to show this lower bound. And I'm not going to go talk about how we show it, but we are able to show uh, some version of that. And if you if you now concat if you now take the uh, if you take this capacity um, capacity inequality between the mutual which gives an upper bound of the mutual information between x star and x hat in terms of the number of measurements, and you have this lower bound for the mutual information in terms of the log epsilon delta covering number. You put these two things together and the lower bound directly transfers and it says that the number of measurements you need should be at least the uh, epsilon, delta, epsilon delta covering number. Right. And now we'll talk about uh, applications of posterior sampling that we've been doing for the last year or two. Um, so compressed sensing MRI, MRI has become very popular and it's actually getting a lot of FDA approval uh, to build devices that actually use uh, deep learning based compressed sensing techniques. And the basic way to model compressed sensing MRI or to model MRI as a compressed sensing problem is, is the following equation, which says that you should think of X star as being your brain scan. And once you put a person into an MRI machine, the way the machine works is that it performs a Fourier transform of your brain with some um, discretization level. So this uh, F would be the discrete Fourier matrix. And then it selects some subset of the Fourier coefficients um, based on some suggestion by the lab tech or the radiologist. So the whole process is your, your brain gets Fourier transformed and then the the machine selects uh, some subset of those Fourier coefficients. And there's also some additive Gaussian noise of variance epsilon square. And this is very clearly uh, a linear measurement process. So everything I said directly transfers because you can just run Langevin dynamics for this, uh, for this compressed sensing MRI problem. Uh, and we compared our results to model and varnet, which are state-of-the-art deep learning techniques, which are trained to use one-third of the Fourier coefficients and reconstruct the brain. So you you feed in a certain um, third of the Fourier coefficients, and these deep learning models will spit out brain reconstructions. And what we find is that if we run Langevin uh, dynamics using a diffusion model trained on brain scans, we are competitive. So the the leftmost image shows the ground truth that a radiologist would like to see. The next two columns show reconstructions by state-of-the-art deep learning baselines. And the last, the last column is our algorithm that uses Langevin dynamics and diffusion models. And we are competitive with these models, which is quite surprising because these things have been trained end-to-end. -end. So they, they have been trained using examples of here's one-third Fourier coefficients, and here's the brain scan I would like to see. And you you train this sort of like a regression framework to say that you will take in Fourier coefficients and then spit out a brain scan. And since it's been optimized for this setting, we were expecting to be uh, beaten a whole, whole lot more by uh, model and Warnet. But what we find is Langevin, which has no 
prior information about what this measurement process would be or which query coefficients are going to be selected is competitive with these algorithms. And now if you change the measurement process a little bit and you say that, okay, instead of taking one third of the Fourier coefficients, I'm going to take one twelfth of the Fourier coefficients, then these deep learning baselines fail because they have been taught how to use one third of the coefficients and get a good brain scan out. Whereas Langevin doesn't care at all. It's been trained only on brain scan. And now if you tell it that, okay, I'm going to give you these one twelfth Fourier coefficients, it just doesn't care. It, it, you run the same algorithm again. You just have to change the, the matrix because now you've gone from one third to one twelfth. But as long as you, you're able to specify that matrix to Langevin dynamics, it gets reconstructions that are much, much better than these baselines. So this is one reason to, to use generative models in that they are much more modular than end-to-end -end deep learning techniques for um, performing compressed sensing reconstructions. So you can use the same generative model and recall that these models are very expensive to train. So if you train one, you can use them for any lab setting or uh, scan setting in the clinic. And another interesting thing we observe is that if you train all of these models on brain scan and you test them on a similar compressed sensing problem, but with knee scan, these algorithms don't break completely. And we find that Langevin tends to be a little bit more robust. So in this case, you get one fourth of the Fourier coefficients of this knee scan. And these, uh, again, the, the left column shows the ground truth that a radiologist would like to see. It's the gold standard. And the next two columns are the deep learning base, the end-to-end -end deep learning baselines, which seem to introduce much more uh, artifacts than Langevin dynamics. Langevin still has some, um, you can see some artifacts over here as opposed to here. Uh, but this was, this was very surprising in that all of these models have never even seen a need before. They've been trained purely on brain scan and you feed them Fourier coefficients of this knee. And supposedly these models can incorporate information about um, the, so the Fourier coefficients contain information that this is a knee, but since you've heavily subsampled and selected only a quarter of the required Fourier coefficients, uh, there will be some blurriness. But if you use the these um, models, they, they know that a brain has some smoothness and structural information in there. And it 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 compiles that information along with information that you you just scanned the knee via the Fourier coefficients to get pretty reasonable knee scans for models that have never even seen a knee or know what a knee is. And quantitatively, we find that um, Langevin is Langevin tends to be better than other algorithms. So we tested it across different anatomies, scanning techniques, and uh, acceleration factors where we, we tune how many Fourier coefficients are shown to the model. And this blue line is Langevin, and you can see that it tends to be um, higher than the rest in, in the majority of cases. Another interesting application we've had is motion correction. So during an MRI scan, if a patient moves their head, like they can either rotate it or translate it, then this movement manifests as a blur. So for example, this L1 wavelet reconstruction shows what happens if a patient moves. Uh, you're not able to tell what state it was in, but assuming that the rotation was rigid, you can actually modify the Langevin update to estimate both the brain scan and what angle or position the brain was in. So if you do that, we're able to see that the our reconstruction over here, which which is using corrupted uh, motion, uh, uh, corrupted measurements that have motion in them, you were able to see that the reconstruction quality is close to what L1 wavelet would obtain if there was no motion. So the the third column is for L1 wavelet if there was no motion at all, whereas the fourth column is our Langevin technique even with motion corruption in the measurement. And then the bottom row shows uh, comparisons of like a zoomed in uh, 
section of the ground truth image. So the ground truth image is here. This is L1 with motion corruption, L1 without motion corruption, and this is ours with motion corruption. So you can see that it's much better. And then these are the errors in each of the algorithms magnified by a factor of 10. Yeah, okay, that concludes my talk. Here's a, this is the code for our uh, MRI project. Um, we've also released our models publicly. So if you would like to use them, feel free to go ahead. And these are the references for my talk. Thank you. Do we have questions for Ajil? Hi, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us something about the comparison between the computational complexity of the Langevin approach you propose versus uh, the one based on uh, deep learning. Right. Um, so when I was running these things, it took. OK, so we don't have, uh, just to be clear, we don't have any theory guarantees for how long Langevin would take on this problem. Uh, th I'm speaking purely in like uh, processing time on the computer. Uh, it, it took me roughly five to six minutes per image, whereas the end-to-end -end baselines are much quicker. They just take five to 10 seconds. But I think that's a problem that was only true in 2020 or 2021. Now you can do uh, posterior sampling or, uh, okay, I don't know if it's actually doing posterior sampling, but there are some uh, sampling techniques, MCMC sampling techniques, which can be done in like 10 to 20 seconds. So uh, speed is no longer a problem. Thank you. Hi. Um... I would like to know, so if you are able to sample the posterior, instead of just taking one sample, why wouldn't you average over it? It shouldn't be better. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, the the pragmatic reason is that it was very slow. So averaging would be okay. would make it even slower. Uh, but we, we saw that. Um, and also, if I was doing it more than once, uh, I could also I could I could pick and choose a cherry pick which reconstruction would be would be would, is best, but that would violate the statistical validity of my results. So then we just chose to take the first sample. But we also ran experiments where we sampled multiple times and then created uncertainty estimates. And yeah, that we see we we saw some diversity uh, over multiple runs of Langevin. So it's totally valid to do this multiple times and take averages or median or uh, yeah, some word, some statistic based on that. Okay, thank you. I have a question, so I guess I will go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. So I, I would argue that one of the of the risk of those algorithms that are based on uh, generative uh, priors is that the generative model has actually a, a lot of information and in some sense is able to hallucinate a solution even if you don't have enough measurements to actually uh, do a, a reconstruction. So you could have something that is very good looking and be very um, confident that this is the right one, but then maybe not. So I don't know if you have any comment on how your methods uh, deal with this, uh, this issue. Uh, yeah, we don't have a comparison right now. And Actually, uh, it's not just generative models. Uh, all deep learning models have some artifact or the other. So even model and varnet, which you think would be more robust, if you train on MRI scans that were done using, say, GE scanners, and you use it on like Siemens scanners, um, it, it, it starts hallucinating artifacts. It, it may not look like a tumor, but there will be like some shading, uh, some artifacts that happen. So yeah, both of these both end-to-end uh, -end deep learning baselines and generative model techniques do hallucinate. Um, and I guess like the, the the threshold should be that radiologists are human and they do make mistakes. So then as long as the generative model, uh, the deep learning model makes mistakes that are rarer than a radiologist mistakes, I think we're okay. But yeah, obviously this needs a lot more study. and. Um, I know that my collaborator, John Tamir, is actually working with 
people or radiologists at UT's medical center to try and see like how these things compare. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe one last quick question. Okay, and if not, I guess for the sake of time, we will leave it there. Thank you very much, Ajil. Uh, thank you.